Well, hey everybody, welcome to another Sunday morning at Living Streams online. Um, it's, uh, it's good to be with you. I hope you're having a great time. I hope you've had a great weekend. Hope the heat hasn't been too much for you. Um, I did go through two nights of no AC this week because something happened with our power. Um, and actually, two of my cars, the battery died. I only have two cars, but both of them, the battery died. So I'm having a little power problem. But I'm excited that uh, Jesus' power is what we really need for life and godliness. And we're going to learn a little bit about Jesus' power and in a miracle that he did, did uh, feeding the 5,000 right before he walked on water and all of these things. So I'm excited about that. If you want to get a Bible and turn to John chapter 6, we'll be headed there. Um, and while you're doing that, I want to tell you about a couple things uh, going on. Please hear me out. Living Streams. For four Sunday mornings now, we have been meeting in the sanctuary. Now, some of you might be like, what? What are you talking about? What is that? Now, it, our main teaching and worship time is right here. It's me talking to this camera, going into your screen, speaking at you in your home or wherever you might be doing that. That's our main teaching and worship time, absolutely. However, we are also now doing Sunday mornings, 8, 9.30, and 11 a.m. right here in the sanctuary for a social distance, face mask, um, worship and prayer time. And it has been unbelievable, so incredible. It feels so right to be here doing this at a time when our society is kind of going up in smoke in some ways. There's a lot of divisions, a lot of hate, a lot of anger, a lot of stirring. And uh, we come in here with that heaviness of walking in this world for a week. And by the time these services are over, that heaviness is gone and there is just strength and there is life and there is hope. Jay and his team are leading us. Um, and I just, I really want to encourage you to come. Um, I don't know how much longer we're going to be doing these Sunday morning prayer and worship attacks is what we're calling them. Um, before we go back to our main teaching and worship time on Sunday morning, all gathered together. But for the next couple of weeks, we're definitely going to be doing the prayer and worship. So go online, register you, your family, bring your whole family in. It's been so beautiful to see a whole pew full of just, just a family, moms, dads, and kids, all coming to just praise the Lord, worship the Lord, and pray for our city, for our nation, for our families, for our church, um, and whatever else the Lord inspires. So please. I, I keep hearing that people don't know about it or they didn't know about it. And I just go, what is I? <laughs> so um, come on down Sunday morning, register online, meet me here. Let's pray. Let's get on our knees, get on our faces, get our hands in the air. And let's see if we can't turn the tide of the battle going on in our, in our city through prayer and worship. All right. So that's going on. Also, um, these next couple of weeks, we're going to be doing some stuff for kids. You know how kids got pushed back a couple of weeks, most of them for school. Um, so we're going to have some stuff um, here on campus that, that kids can come to and just kind of get some encouragement, a safe, sanitary place for them to get some of their energy out. But then on August 17th, we're actually going to be kicking off school together. And this is just a little help we're trying to do for the community where um, we're going to provide a space and some facilitators um, to, to, to have kids come who maybe don't um, have a parent in the home because they got to work or they don't have consistent internet um, or whatever it might be. They just need a place where they can come do their school online and they could come here and go through that whole program with us. So all that information is online. Please go there, check it out, see if you can help, see if you want to register your kids. If you know some kids that, that, that don't have access to some of those things or might be going through a tough time, let them know, bring them down, and uh, we'll see what we can do to help our society get through some of these challenges. So that's that. Um, as far as kids go, today we're going to be talking about the story of Jesus feeding the 5,000 and the young whippersnapper that had a little lunch of two loaves of bread and five, no, five loaves and two fish. Um, and so if you want to draw a picture of a kid giving his five loaves and two fish to Jesus, I'd love to see that. Um, you can email that to me or you can post it in um, the, the, the message down below, whatever. And also, we always love hearing from you. Um, so go ahead and, and hit us up anywhere, whether on YouTube or Facebook or whatever. We'd love to, to hear you, where you're watching from and what the Lord's doing, any prayer requests, that type of stuff. So that's that. Now, we're going to go to John chapter 6, and I want to read it to us, get it in our minds, and then we're going to actually read another passage that um, tells the same story. But John 6, and we're going to start in verse 1. Sometime after this, Jesus crossed to the far shore of the Sea of Galilee, that is the Sea of Tiberias, 
And a great crowd of people followed him because they saw the signs he had performed by healing the sick. Then Jesus went up on a mountainside and sat down with his disciples. The Jewish Passover festival was near. When Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming toward him, he said to Philip, where should we buy bread for these people to eat? He asked this just to test him, for he knew already what he had in mind to do. Philip answered, it'd take more than half a year's wages to buy enough bread for each one, of, uh, each one just to have a bite. Another of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. Here is a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish, but how far will they go among so many? You got the personalities coming out. Philip is kind of more of the business mind where he's like, we can't do this. What are you talking about? He's finding all the logistics, figuring out this, this does not compute. Then you got Andrew who's just kind of going, well, we got this, we got this, but I don't know. You know. I, like, I like the personalities you get in the Bible. Um, Jesus said, we'll have the people sit down. There was plenty of grass in that place, and they sat down. About 5,000 men were there. Now, whether it was just men or if it was families, um, it's kind of hard to know. But here John is, is, is making notice that there were 5,000 men there, and we're going to come back to that. Jesus then took the loaves, gave thanks, and distributed to those who were seated as much as they wanted. He did the same with the fish. And when they had all had enough to eat, he said to his disciples, gather the pieces that are left over, let nothing be wasted. So they gathered them and filled 12 baskets with the pieces of the five barley loaves left over by those who had eaten. After the people saw the sign Jesus performed, they began to say, surely this is the prophet who has come into the world. Jesus, knowing that they intended to come and make him king by force, withdrew again to a mountain by himself. So this is John's account of this story, which is in all four gospel accounts, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. This is one of the only things that is in all four of those accounts because it's so fascinating, so powerful, so amazing that Jesus revealed the, the, the supernatural intervening power of God in this moment by supplying food for all these people from such a small source. Um, how it went about, what it took place, what it looked like when all of a sudden the baskets just kept getting filled. I, I have no idea how it all went down, but it must have just been so wonderful, so amazing. And, and all these people's, you know, just a physical hunger was met in this moment. Um, and, and I want to go back to uh, Luke chapter, uh, Matthew chapter 14, sorry. If, you, if you'll turn there, we get a little bit of detail, um, a little bit of detail that um, John doesn't give us about what brought about this moment. Um, John just basically says, and then after this, and then he goes into the story. But in, Luke, in Matthew chapter 14, um, let's get a little background on what, what was taking place in, in Israel, in Jesus' life right before this moment. It says, at that time, Herod the Tetrarch heard the reports about Jesus and said to his descendants, this is John the Baptist. He's risen from the dead. That is why miraculous powers are at work. Now Herod had arrested John and bound him and put him in prison because of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife. For John had been saying to him, it's not lawful for you to have her. Herod wanted to kill John, but he was afraid of the people because they considered John a prophet. So John was a righteous man. This is John the Baptist. This is Jesus' cousin. He was doing great things for the people of God. He was calling them out of their wickedness, calling them out of their um, selfishness, out of their pride, and, and calling them to repent and get right with God. And one of the things he did is he was speaking out against Herod and his family, the leaders of that day, the kind of the, 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 the Jewish aristocracy that um, were put in power by Rome. So Rome was dominating the whole world, but they would put local leaders in charge. And so um, Herod was kind of a sellout, is what the Jews thought. He was, he was um, kind of in bed with Rome and with, with the Jews, and, and it was not a good situation. He was not loved by the people. Um, and so John the Baptist saw some of the things that they were doing, um, and he was saying, it's not right for you to be taking other people's wives. It's not be right for you to be taking extra wives. This is not right. This is not Jewish. This is not Judaism. This is not of God. He was speaking out against those leaders, um, and it ended up getting him arrested and put in prison. And there he was in prison. And then it says in verse 6, on Herod's birthday, the daughter of Herodias, the one that John was kind of speaking out against, danced for the guests and pleased Herod so much that he promised with an oath to give her whatever he asked. Prompted by her mother, she said, give me here on a platter the head of John the Baptist. The king was distressed, 
But because of his oaths and his dinner, dinner guests, he ordered that her request be granted and had John beheaded in the prison. His head was brought in on a platter and given to the girl who carried it to her mother. John's disciples came and took his body and buried it. And then they went and told Jesus. So the grief of this moment, the, the outrage, the horror, the injustice, um, it, it must have just been absolutely brutal when this took place for the people of Israel. They're oppressed, they're struggling, um, they're poor. Uh, the Roman domination has completely broken their backs. And now here, their ruler, um, Herod, does this completely disgusting act for a completely disgusting reason. And they're left with this whole feeling. And it says John's disciples, the ones that really were hanging out with John and helping out with John's ministry, um, they went and got his body and they buried him and then they went and told Jesus. Now again, Jesus is not just, you know, someone who was a fan of John the Baptist. Jesus, Jesus was John the Baptist's cousin. Jesus was baptized by John the Baptist, you know, to fulfill all righteousness. Um, John the Baptist had already been proclaiming that Jesus was the Messiah. He was the Lamb of God that was going to take away the sin of the whole world. Um, and yet... Now in this moment, John's disciples come and they tell Jesus the news of what took place. And, uh, and I titled this message, The Social Justice of the Social Jesus. And in our day uh, today, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of zeal, there's a lot of unrest, there's a lot of outrage um, about a number of things. And, and uh, I don't think it's too... Um, too wrong or, or too challenging to call this Jesus' George Floyd moment. Now, I, I mean, obviously there, the comparisons break down in a number of ways, but, but this really was a, an intense political, um, a, a, an intense like societal moment that was taking place in Jesus' life. And, and, and I, I think it's very important for us to look at what Jesus does. Um, because we're all right now kind of stirred up. I mean, we've got the election challenges, conservative, liberal, Democrat, Republican. Um, we've got the racial unrest, black, white, um, you know, privilege, no privilege, systemic, whatever. We got all these words that are just kind of firing us all up. Um, and there's anger and there's guilt swirling around. And, and, uh, and, and then, you know, we also have this COVID thing, which, which has a, a lot of confusion. Sometimes they say this, sometimes they say this. Sometimes you think this, sometimes you think that. Um, about how to walk forward, how, what's the best practices to do. So, I mean, our, 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 our nation is so pitted against each other. And, uh, and, and what I'm seeing is that's starting to seep into the church a little bit too, where it just has no place. I mean, we're called to be one. We are one body. We all have one head, and that's Jesus Christ. And so we need to figure out how to be unified above all of our secondary ideas, our, our non-essential concepts or whatever. And so it's good for us to look at Jesus and what he did in his moment of real political unrest and turmoil. Um, and so that's when we have this set up for um, the story of feeding the 5,000. Let's continue in Matthew chapter 13 now and just get these couple verses before we go all the way in. When Jesus heard what had happened... When John's disciples came and told Jesus, he withdrew by boat privately to a solitary place. That was Jesus' initial response. Hearing of this, the crowds followed him on foot from the towns. And when Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them and healed their sick. And then Matthew goes on to talk about what we got in John, how Jesus so separated them all into groups, had his disciples get them all set down, and then he goes and feeds the 5,000. And uh, there's a couple things I just want us to, to notice here is, is when we put these two stories together, what we really have is we have an extremely um, outrageous, horrific political event um, or something that happened in society, an injustice, that causes this crowd to go and find Jesus. Now, Jesus, when he heard it, he withdrew. So then the crowds come to try and find him. So really, the reason that there were 5,000 men, the reason there was this large crowd, was not just because they were wanting to hang out with Jesus. Um, it was a combo. They had seen the power of God revealed through Jesus. They had heard the teachings of Christ that seemed to cut through all the confusion that 
was going on in that day. And so in this moment when they wanted to look to someone to lead, when they wanted to bring about some sort of social change, when they wanted to overthrow Herod, when they wanted to do something because they were so angry, they came to Jesus, which is a great thing to do. But what they found, I think, surprised them because they came to Jesus to, to really say, all right, Jesus, lead the movement. Lead the march. Let's go tear this place down. Let's go to the palace and let's get rid of hair. Let's do all these things. But instead, Jesus withdrew to a quiet place. Jesus set everyone down. Jesus healed the sick among them. Jesus fed them, meeting a practical need. And then in, as we go back to the book of John, chapter 6, it says, and after this, they're so blown away that Jesus was able to feed all of them. They're going, this really is the guy. This is it. Let's do this thing. It says that they tried, that Jesus, knowing they were going to try and make him king, he again withdrew to a quiet place. And then the very next story we have is he's there at a quiet place praying because his heart is broken because his cousin was beheaded. His heart is broken because of the oppression and injustice. But he goes to prayer. That's what it is. He withdraws to a quiet place and prays. And then that night, he sends the disciples out and he keeps praying, but then he walks to them on water, which is an awesome story walks to them on water again, reassuring them that he is in control over all of this stuff and, and departs to, an, to another quiet place with his disciples. And I, I just think this is interesting because, you know, right now, what I felt um, when, when I heard about George Floyd and some of the other cases and, and, I, and I've, I've, I've heard the cry of the black community as, as they're just so frustrated about a lot of their situation, all of that, I immediately was like, okay, I, I want to hear. And so I, I've told you guys a little bit of the story. So um, you 15 of us white pastors went and met with 15 African-American pastors. And, and really, we just went to try and like start the conversation. Hey, tell us what's going on. Tell us where we're at. Tell us what we can do. Um, and it didn't go very well. It was just, it was, there was a lot of distance between us when we got there. And then when we left, there was still a lot of distance. And it kind of broke my heart. I was like, okay, Lord, what do I do? Um, and so, you know, I've just really been diving in to try and learn, to research. I've been reaching out to African-American pastors or Christians that, that I could say, hey, couldn't I just have more one-on-one -on -one conversation and see if that helps. And been getting to know a lot of people, and it's been really neat and really fascinating. I've learned so much um, and been so encouraged by, by some of these men um, that are really trying to, to sort out what to do and, and really trying to do the Jesus way as they go through um, then there was another meeting of those same pastors down at the Capitol where there was going to be a lot of confession and a lot of commitment to going forward. And um, I watched it on Facebook and it was like, yes, these words are good. This is heading in the right direction. And, um, and then we actually flew a guy from St. Louis who is, he was a professor, but right now he's teaching math at a school right next to Ferguson. And he, he was there all of that time. And he, um, he has a very research mind and very, um, a lot of papers he wrote about uh, that time and what, what should be done and what shouldn't be done. And he came out and shared with our staff. I got to be with him and, and really just discover a lot of different things um, that I didn't know. And, and so I've just been trying to dive into this thing. And really what I feel like God has told me is, you know, I, I, well, a lot of times we're supposed to practice what, we're, what we preach. But I felt like what the Lord was telling me is I, we need to practice, 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 practice before we preach. And what I'm seeing a lot of Christians do is they're preaching without, without really digging in and trying to catch God's heart. And that's the first thing we see Jesus do, no doubt about it. Immediately when this happened, and he was Jesus. He knew what to do. Yet still, he withdrew to a quiet place to pray. And I just think for Christians, we got to be there. That's our call right now. We got to seek God's heart. We got to seek his presence. We got to seek his power. Because without his power, all we have is just some more humanistic, secular ideas and strength. It's not going to do anything at all for anyone. Um, there's a story in the Old Testament that I've been chewing on ever since uh, all this took place. Um, it's, it's a really fun story. Um, it's about Joshua and the, the children of Israel where they're going to be heading into the promised land and they're going to be having some battles. Um, between the Israelites and the Canaanites. And, and one of the first places they went to was Jericho with those mighty walls. You probably heard the story about the walls of Jericho. And, and so the night before they were actually going into battle, um, Joshua, who's probably just overwhelmed because of the intensity of the moment that they're about to go into battle, that he's just a brand new leader and, and the Israelites are not warriors by any chance and, and Moses is gone now and he's just kind of overwhelmed. So it says that he went away by, uh, by himself away from the camp. 
And while he was there, I imagine he was praying. Um, but all of a sudden, it says that he saw a warrior standing next to him with his sword drawn. And Joshua startled. And, and the question that he asked in Joshua chapter 4 is, are you for us or are you for our enemies? And then it says that the, the warrior answered, neither. But I'm the commander of the army of the Lord. And the place that you're standing is holy. You need to take your shoes off. And so Joshua takes his shoes off and has this little moment where um, he's talking to the angel of God's armies. And a lot of people think this is a Christophany, an, an appearing of Christ in the Old Testament. And, um, and when I think about this story, it's like the third option, right? So are you for us or are you for our enemies? And I can just hear, you know, people saying, are you for the blacks or are you for the whites? Are you for the Republicans or are you for the Democrats? Are you for my worldview or my philosophy or are you for the opposing world blue, blue, um, worldview philosophy? Like th we're just kind of pitting ourselves against each other. And we're coming to the Lord saying, are you for us or are you for our enemies? And God's like, no, man. No. First of all, God is for everyone. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that, that whoever believes in him, whoever believes in him, whatever their background is, whatever their philosophy, if they put their faith in Christ, if they give their life to Christ, they get eternal life. Whether they get everything right in this life or not, that is the trump. That is the trump card. Sorry, I said trump there. I know you're not supposed to say that. But that, is the, that, that overcomes anything we've ever done. The, the life and blood of Jesus overcomes anything that we could ever do wrong. That's the grace, that's the beauty of it all. That somehow all of us, no matter how hard we try, no matter how hard we fight, no matter how zealous we are, no matter how right we think we are, we are still on the wrong side. Humanity will always be on the wrong side whenever we're doing humanistic ideas. We're all just trying to build a new Tower of Babel. That's what all of these things, capitalism, socialism, communism, whatever it might be. Some might be better for some, some might be better for others. Some might be better in some times, some might be better. I, I don't know, I, none of this stuff. All of them are human philosophies that are gonna leave us all empty and short of the glory of God. So we shouldn't be fighting for them. We shouldn't be making that be all we're about. We wanna get on God's side. And God's side is found in the scriptures. God's side is found in a relationship with him. God's side is the thing that's going to get us from this life to fullness of life. We got to find a way to get you know, off of our side to God's side. And we know that Jesus Christ was the answer. God sent his son into the world to teach us what his side is all about and to lay down his life to provide a bridge for us to get from our side to his side. That's why John, when he starts his book, he says, in the beginning was the word. And he uses the word word to describe Jesus. And the word word in the Greek we've talked about is logos. And it's basically God's universal principle that rules the cosmos. It's what makes life exist and happen. It's God's philosophy. It's God's politic. So if we really want to get from our side to God's side, we gotta, we gotta go through Jesus. We gotta learn his teachings. We gotta learn his way. We gotta apply his blood to our life. We gotta, we gotta um, invite him into our life. And for some of you, you might have spent your whole life looking for the next philosophy or the next idea that might actually make you feel alive or whole. It's never gonna happen. There's only one way to enlightenment and truth. There's only one way to heaven in truth. There's only one way to truth, and that is Jesus Christ. He is the way, he is the truth, he is the life. And here's the, here's the most amazing thing in the world. He loves you, and he wants you to be on his side, be in his family. He wants to come and do life with you. That's what the Bible teaches over and over again, and that's what we see in the life of Jesus. And so that, that's the reality. So basically, we're trying to figure out how to get from our side to God's side. And sure enough, in Joshua's day, God said, well, this is how you do it. This is what you do to get on my side. I want you to walk around the walls of Jericho. I just want you to keep walking consistently, day after day, day after day, in silence. Keep walking, keep walking. And on the final day, I want you to shout. And we know the story. Those walls came down and God's will, God's purposes were brought out. And so for our day and age, when we th see all these dividing walls, when we see all this division, I, I really feel like God has spoken clearly to us about how we're supposed to walk in his way, be on his side right now. And it's to consistently, day after day, 
whether COVID's here or COVID goes, whether the political parties we want or don't want wins, whether, whether we're black, whether we're white, whether we're brown, whatever it might be, this is how we get the walls to come down in our society. We continue to walk with humility and we continue to walk with generosity. Those are the two things that are gonna make the biggest difference in this time. And Jesus said that. He said, if you, wanna, if you wanna come and follow me, he said, come, come learn of me. Take my yoke upon you, learn of me. For I am meek and lowly and humble in heart. That is the way of Jesus. That is the social Jesus. Humility and generosity. He withdrew to a quiet place, he drew everybody in, and he met their needs and served them by feeding the 5,000, by healing the sick, by teaching them his ways. And that's what we get in John chapter six. Now I wanna talk a little bit um, about the power of God um, as far as this miracle, because this is a fascinating miracle. And there, there are a number of miracles in the book of John trying to teach us about God. And, and, uh, and I'm gonna tell us here in just a second what are the things that I think you know, Jesus did and that, that we can mirror as we go through this. But um, one of them is the revealing of God's supernatural intervening power. Um, and there are, there are different people who have experienced that. There's people who haven't experienced that. For me, um, I, have, I have seen God do miracles, signs and wonders. Um, oftentimes, it's not when I really thought he would, um, and it's definitely not been every time. Um, there was a time where I was living in, in a village in Belize, and, and I got to see the scriptures about casting out demons. Um, come to pass as I worked with a young man and prayed over him and, and, and he did experience, you know, two demons actually left him and then he saw a man in white talking to him and it was fascinating and it was, it was something I, never, I hope I never have to be a part of again, um, but it was really cool to see the power of God and, and that supernatural intervening power show up for this young man. Um, I've also been here in the church. Many times we've prayed for people um, and sometimes we, we we believe that they'll be healed, sometimes we don't, and sometimes we get it wrong, because sometimes we didn't think they would be healed and then they got healed. Sometimes we thought they would be healed and then they didn't. Um, but we've seen some actual real bona fide miracles and checked with people weeks afterwards and, and months afterwards, and it's still been true. So um, on the spectrum though, I, I just need us to understand there's this idea of deism. And deism is the fact that God created the world, but then he doesn't intervene. He just kind of wound up the clock and he's letting it go. And deism is not a biblical idea. It's not within orthodoxy. It's not, I, I don't believe it's, it's, it's true at all. Um, but I can get why people would go there. Most of the founding fathers of, of America actually were deistic. Thomas Jefferson, he created a Bible and he took out all the miraculous signs um, and said, now this is the Bible that I believe in. The only problem with that is if you take out the miracles, you take out the resurrection of Christ. If you take out the resurrection of Christ, we are of most men most miserable. We have nothing to hope for. Because if Jesus didn't, wasn't, wasn't a sacrifice that was able to rise from the dead, that means his sacrifice for us was not sufficient. Um, so that's why it just can't be true. But then on the other side of deism, you have this Pentecostalism, where it just basically is like, God's gonna do everything you ever wanted him to do, and if he doesn't, you're doing it wrong. And that, that's not a, a true thing at all either. That gets way outside the biblical concept. And there's one other word I want you to know, it's the cessationism. And cessationism is this idea that that God stopped intervening supernaturally with miracles and all of that, you know, after the acts of the apostles, after basically Peter and James and John passed away. That it was a time that God was doing that and God is doing that no more. And uh, I, I can get why they would say that scripturally, but also at the same time, I've just not found that to be true in my life. And I don't think that that makes sense of the God that we serve either. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. So somewhere in this camp, between this cessationism and this extreme Pentecostalism is, is where I think I'm trying to find my way and where I think um, Living Streams is trying to find our way, where we, we do hope that God will supernaturally intervene, that he'll give us grace in that way. But we also put our hope in God and say, if he doesn't, then he'll give us the grace to endure well. And that, and that like Paul said, if he doesn't give it to us, then we can know 
that in our weakness, his strength will be made perfect. And, and I know you, some of you are both. Some of you have experienced those miracles and you're rejoicing, but then in other areas you haven't. And some of you maybe have not experienced those miracles. It doesn't mean you're necessarily doing anything wrong. But if God says no to the miracle, then that means he's saying yes to the grace that you need to endure. And though it might be hard, you can endure. So that's a little bit about the power of God, the miracles of God, um, because I, I want to mention that because now I'm going to just list as we close what I really do see in the life of Jesus um, what his version of social justice looks like. And first of all, um, withdrawing from the crowd. I think withdrawing from the crowd is something that we all really need to understand. There's a lot of populism. There's a lot of people that are building their lives on rhetoric right now. And we need to make sure and withdraw from the crowd to hear the voice of our God as he guides us through this challenging time. Secondly, we need to serve practical needs. Um, the fatherless, the widow, the, the orphans, these are the people that um, God's heart is really paying attention to, and we should be doing that as well. Um, revealing God's supernatural intervening power, we just spoke about that. Speaking about the kingdom of God, I think it's very important for us to not be spreading other news. Right now, if you're just talking about conspiracy theories or you're just talking about Republican agenda or Democratic agenda, if that's what you're posting and talking about the most, I, I think you just need to take a moment and check yourself and make sure that um, you're talking about the good news of Jesus because that's the message we're supposed to be pre speaking about above everything else. doesn't mean we can't have fun and kind of talk about these things and see where we, we land in these things, but, but if, this be, if, if the political stuff becomes more than the gospel, we got something wrong. Uh, Jesus testified to the truth, and I think as Christians, we need to really be careful to, to, to find out what is true and make sure and help other people find out what is true, not just what is rhetoric. And ultimately, the best thing that we can do is sacrificial love. Give ourselves to others for their benefit. And uh, I want to close with just this story of a guy named Daryl Davis, um, who's a musician and and uh, he's an African-American, and in 1987, he, he, was, he was playing at this um, club, and uh, a, a, a white guy came up to him, and they kind of had a drink together, and he was just saying, man, you play that piano so well, and, and they had this little conversation, and he ended up finding out that this white man was a member of the KKK, and uh, Daryl Davis was kind of shocked and a little unsure what to do, but... Um, they started to talk a little bit more, and, and, and for whatever reason, Daryl Davis felt like this was something that he needed to do. He needed to kind of meet these people, and basically the premise is, how could you hate me if you don't know me? And uh, over time, you know, up to this point, uh, Daryl Davis has been able to get to know uh, 200 different KKK members and actually um, see them, you know, get out of the KKK, and he has a closet full of all their cloaks. Um, as, they, as they get out of there, as they get to know him, they actually end up handing their cloak to him. And I think it's just a beautiful story of engaging into you know, this, this world that we're nervous about. And Jesus, that's exactly what he did for us. He, he who knew no sin became sin for us. He came into our world, he felt our need, he felt our pain and all of that. And he gave himself completely, sacrificially to us. He entered into our world so that he could show us how to get out. And if you can get to know Jesus, if you can get in relationship with Jesus, you will begin to experience his wisdom, his power, and you'll realize it is not of human origin. And it actually can help build the world and build your life and, and bring you to peace. So that's our message today. We're gonna have a little response slide, um, just some things you can pray through. Um, as you're in this message, if you don't know Jesus, if you haven't invited him to be the Lord of your life, um, then these, this prayer is a really great thing. And if you pray this for the first time, we'd love to know about it. Please comment below. Let us know that you gave your life to Jesus and you're ready to go that way and we'll get you baptized or whatever comes next. Um, but for the rest of you that know Jesus, this is still a good thing to pray. Just kind of realigning our hearts with him. God bless you and we'll see you soon.